Thank you for uh, inviting me to be part of this event. Just to spend a second more on sort of what motivated this practice after spending uh, years working in the Senate. You know, I was working for three different senators and in my time in the Senate, never had a meeting with an individual foundation about their actual grant making work. So I'm sitting there as an advisor to Senator Schumer from New York, never talked to Ford or Rockefeller or Carnegie or MacArthur or Kresge or Kellogg, like any of the big foundations. They don't really come up to talk to policymakers about what they do. That's slowly changing now, um, uh, but it really didn't happen much when I was on the Hill. And the analogy I try to draw for people is to, is to sort of look at the private sector and how the private sector handles things. And you know, pharma won't come to the Hill to talk about Merck. So why should the Council on Foundations come to the Hill to talk about Ford? So individual foundations have to come talk about what they do. So that's, uh, that led to this practice that we started and we work with about 130 community foundations around the country uh, to help members of Congress understand community foundations uh, and what they do and how they're different than Fidelity, for example, and how they're different from private foundations. And it's been really interesting work. So with that, I'm gonna share my screen here. And I know that uh, we have more than one speaker today. So I'm going to uh, try to go through this a little more quickly than I would otherwise. Let me figure out how I do my slideshow. There we go. Okay. So uh, first I wanna run through, and is it working by the way? Can everybody just see the presentation? Right, okay. So uh, first I wanna run through sort of the federal um, COVID response so far. So the phase one was the Coronavirus Preparedness and Response Supplemental Appropriations Act, which had about $8 billion in emergency federal funding. And that was followed by the Families First Coronavirus Response Act. That was the legislation that required free testing and had the new regulations related to paid family and sick leave. And then came the CARES Act. So that was the big bill. Um, there are different estimates on that, anywhere from 1.8 trillion to 2.3 trillion. But that was the giant bill that had the different loan programs, the PPP program. Uh, it had the temporary tax incentives for charitable giving that we're gonna talk more about. After that was the PPP money went out the door so quickly, there was phase 3.5, uh, which added about $300 billion to the PPP program. There was new legislation that just passed the House and Senate this week. I'm not sure if the president signed it yet, but there's, some, uh, there's a new PPP uh, legislation that's about to be signed into law that changes some of the rules around the program. For example, giving businesses a longer time to pay the money back, for example, that should get signed into law this week. And then we have phase four. Um, the, you know, the Democratic Heroes Act uh, that passed the House was kind of a wish list. I think it remains to be seen what phase four might look like. Um, I was talking to Doug earlier this week and I thought, you know, the unemployment rate was going to be much higher. Obviously, we had a, a lower unemployment rate than people thought. So I think uh, the Republicans in the Senate are going to want to wait and see how things go for another month or so. So if there's going to be another piece of legislation to assist with COVID, uh, I think it probably won't be till late June or July before that's considered. So I uh, put the Van Halen album cover here uh, because I remember the song, Everybody Wants Some, that was on Women and Children First. And the reason I put this slide here is because you would think that with all of these crises going on in Washington, that maybe lobbying is slowed down a little bit and maybe it's unseemly for business interests to be lobbying the Hill, trying to get their things done. But even though most staff are working from home, there is a lot of lobbying activity going on because what you see when there's legislation that might be moving along is everybody sees that as an opportunity to get their things done. So there is a lot of lobbying activity going on right now and some of that's happening in the charitable sector as well. Um, but it, basically every major interest group is trying to get their issue fixed uh, in the next round of legislation. Um, let's talk about the charitable incentives, because uh, these have important impacts for your clients, but also for the Community Foundation. Um, the first provision was a new above-the-line charitable deduction for non-itemizers. Uh, you may recall that the 2017 tax law sharply reduced the number of people who are itemizing their deductions. So you have a lot fewer people who are itemizing their charitable gifts now than you did before. So this is a new above-the-line deduction for charitable giving. Um, that's uh, a fairly modest provision, but there were a number of senators and House members that wanted to make sure there was something there for non-itemizers. For itemizers, there was a temporary suspension of the income limitation on charitable gifts. 
So this is usually 50% on property gifts, 60% on cash gifts. Those limits have been waived for this year. Um, this is one of those areas where I think there was a technical problem with the, the speed in which the 2017 tax law was drafted. Because my understanding from talking to a number of staff on the Hill is that what Congress intended to do was raise the overall limit to 60%. But the way this law was drafted, it's being interpreted to mean that you only get 60% if all of your charitable giving is in cash. And if any of your gifts are in property, even if it's one share of Apple stock, it reduces your overall limit to 50%. And we don't think that's what was intended. And this might be one of the technical fixes that people are gonna to try to get done either in the next bill or if there's a tax reform bill uh, in a new Congress next year. Um, both of these provisions, however, exclude donor advised funds and supporting organizations. Um, and I'm gonna talk more about that in a minute. Um, for corporations, the CARES Act raised the annual limitation on charitable gifts from 10 to 25% of income and it also increased the limits on food donations. So those were the CARES Act charitable provisions, the temporary provisions. The nonprofit sector has responded to this crisis with some self-regulatory changes that they've initiated themselves, and they're also pushing some non-tax priorities uh, in the next bill. Um, for example, one thing that the nonprofit sector and a number of foundations have done is more than 700 foundations, public and private foundations, have signed a pledge loosening restrictions on grants and making other changes to their grant making processes. So for example, taking multi-year grant commitments and front loading them is something a lot of foundations have done. Another change is um, a lot of foundations will often make their grant making focused on program and they don't want the grant money used for overhead. A number of foundations have changed that to help foundation, to help nonprofits keep their doors open. So there are some changes being made uh, by the nonprofit sector themselves. In terms of lobbying asks, um, the sector is lobbying for expanded nonprofit access to some credit and loan forgiveness and a PPP program set aside. Um, the Fed has announced some new guidelines to help credit flow to small businesses and a separate approach is being evaluated there for nonprofits, but hasn't been passed, not passed yet, hasn't been announced yet. Um, there's an effort to modify the 500 employee cap on PPP loans to allow larger nonprofits to qualify. And then there are some folks pushing for direct financial assistance to smaller nonprofits that wouldn't be set up as loans, but would be direct aid. But separate from those efforts, there are also a number of tax related pushes that the sector is trying to get done in the next piece of legislation, if there is one. The main priority for the sector is raising the cap on the above the line deduction. Um, for example, just this week, six uh, bipartisan senators had a webinar with, uh, I think, over 5,000 people signed in around the country to, to, to watch that uh, announced an effort to try to raise that to $4,000 for an individual and $8,000 for a family. In my opinion, I don't love the above the line deduction, so um, I would like to see more lobbying energy in the sector focused on some other changes, but this is the one issue that uh, has galvanized the most lobbying and advocacy support in the nonprofit sector. One thing that some folks are pushing, but I am doubtful will get done, is to uh, allow people to take some charitable gifts that they've made this year and count them on their 2019 returns. And the reason for that is the filing deadline, I believe was extended to July 15th. So since people have the extra time to file, there are some folks that wanna let people take gifts they're making now and apply them to last year. But I think that's too complicated uh, and, and won't get done. Another issue is the volunteer mileage reimbursement rate. This is an issue I know well, because when I worked for Senator Schumer, this was actually my bill. And it's a great example of how um, things that nobody opposes still have trouble getting done sometimes. So the IRS has the statutory authority to change the mileage reimbursement rate for people who use their own personal vehicles for business or for medical purposes. So in January, they'll issue a notice every year saying that you can deduct 57 cents a mile or what, I don't know what it is this year. I think it's about 57 cents a mile. But if you use your car for volunteer or charity purposes, that number is set in statute in the 86 Tax Reform Act at 14 cents a mile. So for business purposes, it's 56 or 57 cents. And for volunteer or charity purposes, it's 14. And it hasn't been fixed because it costs over a billion dollars over 10 years to fix. But this is something that maybe in a bill where people are not paying attention to the cost, that this can finally get done and let the IRS have that authority. 
Um, a big one for community foundations is uh, allowing donor advised funds and supporting organizations to be eligible for the temporary incentives. The most important one from our perspective is the AGI limitation. Um, and, uh, and we'll talk more about that. Six philanthropic groups, Council on Foundations, the Philanthropy Roundtable, our group of community foundations, and several others signed a letter advocating for this change to allow donor advised funds and supporting organizations to be included in the temporary incentives. But overriding all this debate about charitable giving are some concerns in terms of overall giving trends. Um, I don't know the Columbus Foundation's own statistics, but there's some new surveys nationally on how people are, uh, how, peop how many people are giving to charity. So a recent Gallup survey found that the share of Americans giving to charity is down to 73%, which sounds like a high number, but it's actually a new low. And there are big declines among modest income groups which is interesting because many of these groups weren't itemizing anyway. So you wouldn't think that the 2017 tax law would have a major change on their behavior, yet some of the biggest declines in charitable giving are among these modest income groups that weren't itemizing before. Another poll found that a fifth of donors said they wouldn't be giving to charity until the economy is better. Um, I think this with the stock market rebounding so much though, and uh, it'll be interesting to see how statistics look for the rest of this year. And one question is whether the COVID-19 crisis is going to affect this overall trend line or will declines in income overall outweigh the increased generosity uh, from this current situation. And one question I have is whether things that the sector uh, are advocating, are they big enough? You know, if you change things on the margin, if, you, if you're looking to really shift the trend in charitable giving, will small changes on the margin really make a difference? One thing that's interesting is that if you look at charitable giving over time, it stays at about 2% of national income. And this has been true for decades. And so folks in the sector are thinking about how can we shift that in a significant way? How can we go from two to two and a half or 3%? And I don't know that just a small change in, in for example, the above the line deduction is gonna lead to that kind of significant shift. So let's talk about the CARES Act and the donor advised fund critics and why they're excluded. So, Donor advised funds, which are, of course, a very important tool for community foundations. Um, you know, community foundations are not just donor advised funds, the way, say, Fidelity's charitable gift fund is, but they are a very important tool for community foundations of all sizes. And they are excluded from the CARES incentives because of a decision made back in 2006, where uh, donor advised funds and supporting organizations were excluded from the IRA rollover, and then that language continues to get copied over and over again. And the rapid growth of donor advised funds has created a few vocal skeptics, not a lot of critics, but I would say half a dozen uh, academics or folks who write on blogs who are continually writing pieces critical of donor advised funds. And we're working hard to push back on those critiques because DAFs have become a hugely popular tool for people to engage in philanthropy, as you know and your clients know. And I distinguish this a little bit from, uh, from charity. You know, when we talk on the Hill, uh, and we try to educate Hill staff about community foundations, we talk a little bit about this difference between being charitable and being philanthropic. And I think uh, donor advised funds are a great way for people to shift from being charitable to being philanthropic. And I'll talk a little bit more about that at the end. Um, even the harshest staff critics though, this is part of the dynamic affecting our work here in DC, even the harshest donor advised fund critics like community foundations. And part of that is because uh, I think of, of our work in DC, but just generally, unlike private philanthropy, community foundations are in every congressional district. So it doesn't matter how red or blue, how urban or rural, your area is represented by a community foundation. So members of Congress know that, they know the board members, they know some of the donors. So one important strategic question for our field is, how do we respond to the fact that the critics of donor advised funds are focused on a different group of providers than community foundations, but yet we know that if Congress aims to regulate donor advised funds, community foundations would be affected by that. So it's an important dynamic that we're working with our community foundations group here in DC. So in the COVID crisis, community foundations have been leading the charge. Um, our group is tracking COVID-19 funds at community foundations both among our 130 or so clients and not. Um, we have tracked 550 community foundations that have COVID funds that have raised almost $900 million and already granted out about half of that amount. And uh, 
donor advised funds on top of that, because the COVID funds aren't necessarily donor advised funds. They may be funded by DAFs, but they're not DAFs. Separate from that though, DAFs are a hugely powerful tool during this crisis because they're the available capital that's the safety net for nonprofits. And we surveyed our group of 130 community foundations. And as of last week, about half have responded. And if you compare March, April of 2019 compared to March, April of 2020, at those 65 community foundations, grant making from their donor advised funds was up $300 million, which is a 58% increase on top of the normally high payout rates. So I want to talk for a minute about DAFs as the pathway from charity to philanthropy. You know, we know that as professional advisors, some of your clients use the Columbus Foundation. Some of them may use another DAF sponsor. Some may use both. And um, in many communities, actually, there isn't, you know, in some communities, there's a friendly competition. In other communities, uh, community foundations and the commercial DAF sponsors like Fidelity and Schwab are partnering. But there are still some things to watch. You know, one of which is this thing I mentioned before about uh, the politics and future tax policy, where the negative attention on donor advised funds is focused on the big financial institutions. So this begs the question about future policy changes and how we respond. Um, and then second, on this transition from being charitable to being philanthropic, you know, community foundations are a great vehicle for that. Um, when we talk to folks on the Hill, and I tell a funny story here, you know, and, and Susie, who works with me, is uh, listening to the webinar, and she used to work on the Hill too, so she'll know this. When you work in the Hill office, you, you're doing the same meetings over and over again. So if I work for Senator Schumer, you know, every company that wants to come in and talk about the R&D tax credit, I've got to do that meeting because they're a constituent company. So you're used to doing the same meetings over and over. And so if you have an opportunity to go in and talk about a different issue or bring a different angle to a topic, we really look for staff to kind of like tilt their head and do what we call like the puppy dog nod, like, oh yeah. And if we do a meeting on the Hill, and Doug's been with me several days on the Hill, and you get that kind of reaction from a staffer where you've, where you've given them something new to think about, we regard that as a successful meeting. And this comparing charity to philanthropy is one of the things that we do to try to get the, that puppy dog nod. What I mean by that is that, uh, you know, somebody can be very charitable and write checks to charity every year. Maybe they use a commercial donor advice fund. They know the charities they wanna support and they're very generous. That's being charitable. But when you reach a point in your life where you're transitioning to a different part of your uh, charitable giving, where maybe you want to work with other donors to tackle a persistent local problem, or you want to set up something for your children to participate in, but you're not wealthy enough to have a private foundation, or in my case, uh, you know, you're very interested in particular subject areas, but you don't know the best charities doing the best work, and you want to get some help. You want to be more strategic or purposeful with your giving. Community foundations are great for that. And I know I am more than happy to pay the slightly higher fee to have a staff there that can help me be more strategic uh, with my charity. So with that, uh, that is the end of my presentation. So uh, we'll, we'll tackle a few of the charitable cares topics that, uh, that, that Jeff had tackled earlier, uh, but also, um, a little bit of what's, what else is new uh, from a financial planning and estate planning standpoint that we should pay attention to in the uh, CARES Act and also the SECURE Act that was only passed a few months before that. And also what else is new with, uh, you know, uh, with not only with COVID, but with the economic uh, downturn and, and volatility and low applicable federal interest rates, what should we be thinking about uh, in the estate and financial planning and charitable planning topics? So, you know, first of all, I just wanted to point out in the next slide uh, that regarding all kinds of extensions, you want to look at the irs.gov coronavirus website, and you'll see um, you, most of you are familiar with the extensions, uh, you know, that are kind of automatic. You didn't have to file a formal extension uh, to get an extension until July 15th, including IRA contributions and things like that. And the IRS has slowly trickled in uh, extensions in other areas, such as estate tax returns and gift tax returns and qualified disclaimers even and different things. There's all kinds of extensions if you go to that website. If you're working with a multi-state uh, client, look at that AICPA uh, link at the bottom of your screen. There's 50, you know, links to the 50 state departments with all their different uh, state by state extensions as well. 
And going to the next slide, you've got in the CARES Act, uh, just a little bit on the advanced rebate. Everybody's kind of heard about this in the news. If you didn't qualify to get a, a check yourself, the clients that you're working with, many of whom would have gotten this. The one thing that I'd point out towards the bottom is, that's a little bit unique is those of us who deal with the states and trust, and of course, somebody, someone, one of your clients surely probably has died in the last few years and probably got a check, right? And so the debate that's been going back and forth on this is, should you send it back? Uh, the, the CARES Act basically says if you're in a state or a trust, you don't qualify. Well, when does that evaluate it? Is that evaluated in 2018, 2019, 2020, uh, when the act was passed, when the check was sent, uh, when they started sending checks? Um, it's really a little bit unclear. Mnuchin says, pay back the money. Um, and if you look at the FAQs that are on the, the website, uh, they basically tell you that uh, to pay the money back without any kind of instructions as to when the date applies. I think reading the act, it, there's a very, very good argument to be made that if your client was alive on January 1, 2020, or at least even better, when the act was passed, you probably do have a uh, cause to go ahead and keep the money because I think under the act that, you know, you're basically vested in the tax credit. Um, but if you died, you know, if your client died in 2018, 2019, probably not. Uh, as far as other people who getting money that they didn't qualify for, the $500, uh, per child tax credit, um, you, you know, you had a child that turned 17, 18 uh, during that time period and you got an extra 500 that you weren't entitled to. Surprisingly, the FAQ say keep the money. Uh, so keep that in mind. That's a little bit of an update on the next slide that we've got. Uh, just a kind of a planning concern. The way the, the this $2,400 per, you know, uh, per married clients, $1,200 works. And, and by the way, they may add to this. Uh, as Jeff had mentioned, you know, there's going to be part two, part three, part four, you know, of, of, of all kinds of things coming out of the hill. And so there may be more money coming. So this might not just be $1,200. It might be another $1,200 come by the end of the year. So the way this uh, tax credit works, it, it's really bizarre the way they set it up uh, because it's a 2020 tax credit, but it was based on the, at least the initial check was based on 2018 or 2019 AGI, depending on whether you had your filings done by then. Uh, the gist of it is it won't be clawed back. So if you if you make more money in 2020, or, okay, uh, like let's say you made $150,000 last year, but you made $100,000, $200,000 this year, um, you know, so you wouldn't qualify, that won't be clawed back. Um, so even though you wouldn't have qualified based on 2020 AGI, they're like, okay, go ahead and keep it and we won't penalize you. The, but there is an upside potential if you if your AGI goes down this year, uh, you may qualify. So an example on the middle of the screen, married couple, no minor children, they've made 200,000 AGI in 2018, 2019, whenever it was based on, so they didn't get a check. Uh, if they make less than that in 2020, they may get a check though. They may get a 2020 uh, tax credit based on the CARES Act and 24, uh, 64, 28 of the code. And so actually doing some planning, like uh, selling $3,000 of uh, securities for to take a capital loss, or perhaps, uh, you know, in, in my example here, an IRA uh, contribution to lower your AGI uh, may get you more tax credit indirectly, right? Because you're lowering your AGI and that's kind of like getting an instant return on your money because you're qualifying yourself more uh, for more tax credit. If you're in this phase out range, you know, somewhere in the 150 to 200,000 if you're married or half that if you're uh, single. So going to the next slide, uh, uh, Jeff had mentioned this. The only thing about the $300,000, $300 above the line charitable donations, uh, it, it is in cash and, and it's not going to be allowed to a donor advice fund. Um, I've read some articles that have said that this is a permanent provision. It's not a permanent position, provision. It's, it's just worded awkwardly in, in the act. Uh, the question that, that's come up is, do you get $300 each if you're married or do you get $600? Or do you, you know, or it's at three hundred dollars capped at three hundred dollars. Uh, as I read the statute, I thought it, you know, made sense. When you read some of the language, any individual who does not like to itemize deductions, uh, that should be any in individual. That's my spouse and myself. Six hundred dollars. Uh, that's not the way the Joint Committee on Taxation report reads it. 
uh, when they came out with their summary of the act, they said, no, it's the limits $300. Uh, why they're trying to be hyper conservative in, in their reading for $300, I, I don't know. I don't know that that's necessarily what Congress intended. The joint committee report is not authority. You know, the Treasury may come out with you know, more firm guidance uh, a little bit later. Uh, so here's the takeaway. I'm in this category. I'm a standard deduction person. I'm, I don't uh, have enough itemized deductions and charitable donations. Uh, I'm going to make a, you know, my checks with my wife and I'm going to have two separate checks and I'll get the receipt from the charity and maybe, you know, uh, I'm contentious and a tax attorney, so I don't mind taking the position that the tax excess $600. Uh, and so well, maybe I'll, maybe I'll get a $600 deduction. It's not big money. So don't overpromise your clients. Just tell them to seem the worst case scenario. But still, you know, write write one check each, for, you know, if you're so inclined. Uh, the next slide, uh, Jeff, had, I've gone over this a little bit more, but let me just note one planning, to, you know, uh, aspect to this AGI limitation and um, and the changes there. You know, you uh, we don't see a lot of people that can give away 100% of their AGI, but you may see more people this year with the income going down, particularly if you've got business interest and in net operating loss carry forwards and things like that. Um, if you do have a C corporation owner, I did want to kind of just point out the uh, something on the bottom of the screen and I'd had a little bit more detail in the, in the later version of the slides, but uh, let me just go into that real briefly here now because they've raised the, the, uh, the AGI limitation from 10% of net income to 25%. Who's, who does this maybe benefit and who do you want to look out for? If you've got C corporation owners um, who are charitably taxed, then it pays a dividend, it pays a tax. But your, your small business owners are probably going to bonus out at the end of the year. And so they say, well, we're not, Ed, I'm not really paying a double tax, you know, because coincidentally the company makes a bonus and we really don't have any income in the C corporation. But when you look at the, the net effect, it's still going to work out better coming from the C corporation. Why? Because you're lowering the Medicare surtax. So even if somebody's making well above the 137,000 and change uh, wage base, uh, you're still paying 2.9% and, and maybe a 0.909% uh, Medicare tax above that, remember. And so if I can make, you know, contributions from the C corporation, instead of bonusing to me, I'm saving Medicare taxes. And I'm also lowering my AGI, which, you know, might affect other tax credits and deductions and things on my own personal return. So if you've got C corporation owners, uh, keep that in mind that, that, you know, when they're doing their charitable planning, to have them look at the tax effect it might be much better if they're giving from the C corporation directly than from their own personal, uh, you know, pocketbook. So go to the next slide. Uh, there's some uh, in the CARES Act, we put together all kinds of changes in uh, RMDs and, and IRA planning uh, to speak of the, there are no RMDs for 2020. And so if somebody's, uh, uh, you know, that might be another reason why somebody might say, well, uh, let's look at making additional charitable donations this year because I don't have to take any money out of my IRA. Uh, can I, you know, give those to the uh, uh, charity or not, remember the rules for qualified charitable uh, distributions didn't change. So the the SECURE Act changed uh, the, the uh, rule for a lot of RMDs from age 70 and a half to age 72. But that rule didn't change for the qualified charitable distributions. Just so you know, that rule is still stuck at 70 and a half age. So if you're over that age, 70 and a half, and you have an IRA, you can make a qualified charitable distribution from that IRA directly to charity and it and it basically doesn't add to your AGI which can be pretty important in many circumstances not just for federal taxes but for Ohio taxes it's going to get you a better result making that distribution on this slide they, there's some question about uh, if you if you took an IR RMD but before the tax act was passed and you didn't know better uh, can you put it back well if you took that RMD between February and May, you've got until July 15th to put it back. Uh, they didn't put any kind of ruling out uh, in the IRS notice about making it in January. So we're going to await additional guidance from Treasury, hopefully, on that. Uh, Act Tech, I was part of a committee that's requesting guidance on that. 
and uh, we may get some guidance on the CARES Act first before the SECURE Act actually in the next few months. Uh, but see that notice for how the one, one per year 60 day rule works and, and all of that. Uh, going to the next slide, uh, some other changes specifically to COVID you know, are uh, realizing that people got laid off and they're, they're maybe hurting and they need some short-term cash. There's a provision to get money out of IRA pension plan up to $100,000, uh, even though somebody's under 59 and a half without that 10% withdrawal penalty, but it's still taxable. It's not like you're getting that money out tax-free. Uh, there's a special provision to spread it out over three years though. So for instance, a third in 2020, a third in 2021, and, and a third in the following year. Uh, the rollover period for those distributions is extended and it's not considered, it is considered a direct rollover. So it's not coming under that one per year rule um, for 60 day rollovers. Now, the question I would say is, is it a good idea? If you've got some clients that are considering this, you have a good heart to heart with them, have them go to a financial planner and maybe if straits are dire enough, a bankruptcy attorney before they take $100,000 out of their IRA our pension uh, plan because you know those those monies are protected in bankruptcy and so if somebody's really on really hard times maybe they should consider bankruptcy and then that money that's in the IRA would help them restart their their life again as opposed to having it basically go down go down the drain so to speak and and not be there you know if the bankruptcy is probably inevitable anyway so keep that in mind and maybe you can do it but it's not necessarily a great idea for everyone Going to the next slide, uh, some other updates uh, on the SECURE Act. And, you know, originally we had, were supposed to get together back in, I think in March, uh, on the SECURE Act and its impact. So uh, I've only got to, just a couple slides to keep in mind on, on this, but the, you've probably heard that the stretch IRA is dead, so to speak, for 90% of the cases out there. They basically said, you can't leave the money to kids and grandkids and have it stretch out for 50, 60, 70, up to 80 years for some young toddler um, anymore. We're gonna limit it to 10 years in most cases, right? Uh, there's some exceptions for eligible designated beneficiaries. And, and so, you know, you may wanna be thinking, rethinking uh, beneficiary designations. Many of them you're gonna leave as is. If you've named it spouse and kids before, you're probably gonna keep the exact same thing. Um, you're just not gonna get as long of a tax deferral, but you might, you might think is, no, oh, geez, you know, I thought the kids were going to get it over 10 years and now it's going to be compressed tax rates for them. Uh, and man, maybe I'll siphon off 10, 20 percent of this to charity instead. Uh, they're not going to pay any tax on this IRA money. So that's one thing that, you know, might be a factor in evaluating uh, IRA beneficiary designations. Uh, Reevaluating trust is more difficult because you've got to look at the trust document. I see a lot of uh, slides, articles and in the popular press about this. And some people say, well, conduit trust is a disaster or other, you know, other trusts shouldn't be used at all or accumulation trusts are fine, leave them as is. And I disagree with all of those conclusions. Conduit trust, remember, is a trust that pays out any distribution to the trust outright to the, to the beneficiary immediately. Uh, those could be a disaster because you've got the compression into 10 years. And so the RMD under the 10 year rule is not one tenth, one ninth, one eighth, or 10% a year, something like that. The rule for the, under the new 10 year rule for SECURE Act is everything, it, there's no RMD for nine years and then everything is out in the last year. And so if you had a conduit trust, that could be a disaster because it could be nothing for nine years and then everything in the last year if you didn't have good distribution, flexible distribution language inside of the uh, trust agreement, that could be a disaster. So you may want to look at any conduit trust, especially, but accumulation trust could be a disaster. I've seen some that are a disaster. Why? Well, because you're going to, accumulation trust allows the asset to be trapped and the income to be trapped in trust. And if you don't have flexible distribution language, because the IRA is coming out in 10 years to the trust, it's going to be, you know, it's going to be trapped into the trust if you don't have flexible enough distribution or liberal enough distribution language to have it go out of the trust, it's going to get trapped in that highest tax bracket. There is a, a method uh, to get the best of all worlds to be able to have it keep in trust, but yet be taxed at the beneficiary's tax bracket. And that would be through granting a withdrawal right over taxable income that 
to the extent it's not withdrawn, it permits it to stay back in trust. That shifts the taxable income over to the beneficiary and lets it remain in trust to the extent that it's not withdrawn. That's called a beneficiary deemed owner trust. The next couple of slides, I have some just some uh, summaries. This is why you got to really pay attention if you look at the red arrow going to the tax bracket here for trust. That's why you really want to pay attention to tax bracket management um, when you're planning with IRAs and specifically when you're pl planning with IRAs and trust together at the same time. Doesn't mean don't use them. It may still be the most prudent thing to do for somebody's estate planning and their family situation, but you got to really pay attention to this compressed tax bracket. On the next slide, I just got a, a a summary of the new rules and how they apply and one thing that you that i keep in mind is it still matters how the trust is drafted uh, does it qualify as a designated beneficiary see through trust or not not all trusts qualify uh, unfortunately the law is a little bit uh, negative towards charities if you have, have a charity as a potential uh, beneficiary in that mix my recommendation is well, just, just leave the charity and IRA sliver of the IRA directly. Uh, mixing it in with the trust beneficiaries, individuals can sometimes lead to negative results, most especially the bottom row on that uh, screen. You could get stuck with the five-year rule, even worse than the 10-year rule, uh, if you don't have a qualifying trust or estate, and that would be one that might include charities in the mix as potential beneficiaries. The 10-year rule applies in most cases. That's for whenever I've got a qualifying trust and or a designated beneficiary individual. There is a special carve out though for certain categories of beneficiaries and that's on the eligible designated beneficiaries. That top row is a surviving spouse, a child under the age of majority, a child of the owner, not just any child. If I name a niece or nephew, they don't count. Uh, somebody who's disabled or chronically ill, so you could still use a uh, special needs trust if you draft it appropriately. Um, and also somebody who's not um, any more than 10 years younger. So if I name my sibling, for instance, that'd be the most common scenario. I name my two sisters, uh, one's older than me, one's younger than me. Those would still qualify for the stretch. They, you know, uh, they're older, so they're not going to get the 50, 60 years stretch. But uh, at my age, you know, my sisters would get another you know, probably 35 years or something along those lines in the tables. Uh, so they still get the stretch, the eligible designated beneficiaries. On the next slide, we I just put together a quick summary uh, and it's got the uh, spousal rollover is always going to be the best from an income tax perspective. That doesn't fit everybody's financial, you know, and planning and estate planning situation, especially blended families scenarios. So, you know, but we've got kind of down the screen uh, from, from best to worst, et cetera. You've got uh, spousal inherited IRAs, beneficiaries less than 10 years younger, et cetera. So I won't go into all the detail here, but it's just kind of a, a, a quick, quick summary of the different RMD uh, categories post Secure Act. Um, and then on the next slide, we've got, uh, and, and by the way, I have updated these these two slides and, and maybe we'll go ahead and send the updated slides. Um, it's a little bit clearer than the one on the screen because we've got a lot of boxes and arrows and things like that that I won't go into, but it's just to tell you that you has got these certain special categories of beneficiaries and then um, most though we're going to use a 10 year rule, uh, they're going to be in that other category. And then on the next slide, okay, then the question is from a planning perspective, from a a trust and state attorney or a trustee's perspective, how, how should this be drafted to, for optimal income tax planning and asset protection planning results? And my attempt on this slide was just to kind of have a little bit of a decision tree chart, so to speak. You know, uh, what are the factors? Why would I have a traditional non grantor discretionary trust? What would I add to that to get the best tax result potentially? And when would I want to use a, what I call a beneficiary deemed owner trust design? One thing I want to point out from a, a charitable perspective and somebody that has trust, you, you're going to have a, a category of a lot of people uh, who would love to add, add charities in the mix for their kids. Why? Because as Jeff had mentioned, so many of the population don't itemize anymore. 80, 90% of people are standard uh, deduction takers now after the Tax Cut and Jobs Act. 
Well, we'd love to avoid that compressed tax bracket by giving our children and grandchildren or whoever are going to be the beneficiaries of our trust, the power to get an above the line deduction, which is what you get uh, under 642C under, you know, for trust in the states, giving money to charity gets an above the line deduction. That could be pretty important. You want to, if you had only non IRAs and 401ks, you'd all, you'd add that kind of clause to every trust you do. Why wouldn't I just allow my kids to make a charitable deduction from the trust? Get, and they get a better tax deduction. There's an exception to that negative rule though. If I'm over seven, my required beginning date, and that's the top right of your screen, the, um, the, there's a quirk in the rule that I may get more than 10 years stretch, even, even though my trust doesn't qualify. Um, and if it's what I call non-qualifying trust, I may be able to get even longer than than ten years out of the out of the trust, and so it, it, and this was on the top right of the, the prior slide. Sorry about that, uh, but the point I made on that is that you've got um, you can add charities in the mix, a power limited lifetime power to appoint to charities or even charitable trusts, and that gives you opens up a lot better tax planning opportunity for you. Uh, next next slide, uh, Lisa. Uh, one of the things that we've got to keep in mind that really impacts grats and clats and things like this, the alphabet soup or the more advanced planning strategies is the low applicable federal rates. And I had had June up here that's much lower and July will probably be lower still. The section 7520 rate is what's used for uh, uh, charitable remainder trust and, and uh, grats and clats and things like that. If you have interfamily loans, that's what uses the short-term or mid-term or long-term applicable federal rate, depending on how long the, the note would be for. And so that's 0.43% midterm rate uh, this this month, 1.01% uh, in July and June um, for long-term and 0.6% uh, on the 7520 rate. So the obvious impact of that is that the lower the rate, remember, is that what we call it the hurdle rate. It, it makes grants and clats much more protect, you know, attractive. Clats being a charitable lead annuity trust. And, you know, you might even consider, you know, particularly for hard to value assets, gifting to both of those at the same time, kind of whipsaws the IRS a little bit uh, because you can get, if the IRS says, well, your discount wasn't appropriate and we think that it should be valued higher. Well, that means you get a larger charitable deduction because the value that, of the assets that went into the clat went up in value. Uh, so uh, the, the low rates really kind of uh, turbocharge some of this type of planning. Uh, the rats we're usually not using unless somebody's worried about, you know, of estate tax. It's an estate tax play, right? Um, many people think, yeah, well, it was going to go down in, you know, in 2025, but with $3 trillion of additional debt, um, <laughs> maybe just maybe the estate tax exemption might go back down to $5 million again. And so more people might be considering uh, about the state tax planning. Clats, remember, you know, charitable lead trust is, might be a way to kind of front load gifts that are made every year and get a tax, higher tax deduction in year one. So you've heard about bunching strategies that we talked about, and I'm sure the Community Foundation has talked about bunching strategies that kind of, you know, give a little two, two years or three years of, of payments at once. Clats are basically allowing you to do something very similar. Uh, but they have a kind of a side benefit of an additional estate tax benefit um, because you're you're able to front load uh, the money that you put in there and the CLAT gets you a tax deduction in year one for giving it away in years one through five or however long the CLAT's going to occur. It might be 10 years. Um, so th there's uh, these, these kind of vehicles, they are a little bit more complex, of course, to deal with, but they do look much better with low interest rates. Uh, installment sales to irrevocable grantor trust are equally attractive. Um, and even a, a simple loan to the family. You know, if I just loan $500,000 to my kid, you know, I can charge for nine year note 0.43% uh, in June. Um, you know, the, it's like $2,400, something like that, the interest uh, that's paid. Uh, that's not very much tax drag at all. So um, if the, my kids can make over point four, three percent on their money. It's a, it's a win for them. I'm shifting wealth to them without being considered a gift. On the next slide though, keep in mind, you know, I, I see this 
very often where people will say, well, I'll just forgive the annual exclusion amount every year. Well, the IRS does, says that's really, you intended to make a gift in year one. Uh, we're, you know, we're gonna kind of call, uh, call, call you out on that. That's kind of a red flag to the IRS. Uh, and there are recent cases, there's a site a link to the recent case, the State of Moore case, and basically, you need to, you need to have a bona fide loan and not be considered a gift, you got to really make payments on these loans. Um, and so try, try to make it, to, you know, appear like a third party, you know, arm's length transaction the most you can if you really want it to be treated as a loan for tax purposes. And uh, take a look at that State of Moore case if you don't believe me. On the next slide, uh, a couple of other thoughts uh, that, uh, you know, we don't see, I don't see any crats at all bank wide lately, but uh, the crats charitable remainder trust aren't quite as affected as by 75, 20 rates as a crat would be. Um, you know, are we still going to get as many cruts this year, you know, with the market down somewhat? Probably so. You might still get people that might want to you know, get out of a concentrated asset because, you know, really the market's not down as much as people may think. It's on the year the Nasdaq's not down at all, I don't think. Um, and so it's, uh, we may still get people that want to use a charitable remainder trust uh, that's in a crut is not going to be quite as affected by low rates as a crat would be. The other thing that people might be considering is a, a crut to get a longer stretch out as from an IRA. So if uh, I leave an asset to my now, I can't use my daughter's example, but maybe when my daughter's a little bit older, if I leave a, my IRA to a somebody who's, say, age 30 and uh, say, says to the charitable trust, pay to that person, a unit trust is 5% or whatever for life uh, to that 30-year-old, um, basically, you've got essentially the same thing as a stretch IRA by deferral, deferring the asset over that child's lifetime. Um, of course, the charity does have to get an actuarial value of at least 10% to qualify. Uh, but if it's a long-term stretch, the tax deferral could actually make up for the fact that the charity is getting at least 10% remainder interest. There's a lot of non-tax reasons why somebody's not going to set that up. It's a little bit more complicated. Uh, you, you know, the you can't access principal like for health education, maintenance support, and things like that. Um, but maybe if it's a small portion of an estate uh, and if it's somebody that's terribly minded, I think that probably the sweet spot for having IRAs payable to trust is the, the person with one, uh, only child that uh, has no grandchildren and they want the remainder to go to charity or somebody that doesn't have children at all, they want to leave money to their spouse and then to their favorite charity. Well, a charitable remainder trust might work out very well as a beneficiary of an IRA in those situations. Uh, going to the next slide. Um, another uh, kind of an overlooked technique that uh, really benefits from very low interest rates is a gift of a remainder interest in a farm and residence. That's not using a trust, it's actually through a deed. Uh, somebody can basically gift a remainder interest uh, by deed to their favorite charity uh, and they get to live and use the property just as they always have, but it goes to the charity at their death and the, they get a current deduction today. So it works a little bit similar to a charitable remainder trust in that regard. You're getting a tax deduction today for giving away your death. Um, but the key thing is for many people, particularly in nervous times uh, that we have today with COVID and everything else that's going on, uh, people don't wanna give access the way access to liquidity. They want that you know, extra cushion, that safety net. Even people that have $10 million and above sometimes really wanna have that access, to that safety net, and they don't wanna give away too much of their liquidity and tie up too much of their liquidity. Uh, even though they may have 10, 20% or more of their estate going to charity at death, they fear their retirement, right? So um, a gift of a remainder interest in a farmer residence doesn't have that kind of uh, stigma of giving up dollar one, although as a practical matter, you're gonna wanna give at least a few thousand dollars to the charity to kind of, you know, uh, help to help them to pay for you know, any kind of uh, compliance and in, in, in looking into the property and making sure there's not a, you know, a environmental disaster on the land and things like that. Uh, so going to the next slide, um, the, you'll hear a lot and I've seen a lot of articles saying, well, the market's down, everybody should make Roth conversions. 
Um, easier said than done. Uh, I think it, it is something that people can, should consider. I mean, we, we've done a few this year uh, at the bank and we, we'll talk about them. Uh, it's not all or nothing. You know, you can carve out 10,000, you know, 20, 50,000, you know, enough that you're not getting into the higher tax bracket and let's just convert some of this money to a Roth. You do have to pay for it. If I convert fifty thousand dollars, that's adding to my income. I've got to, you know, pay the piper and pay. You know, that goes onto my AGI and my income as ordinary income when I convert it to a Roth. The Tax Cut and Jobs Act eliminated a, you know, planning strategy loophole, gaming, whatever you may call it. We, we used to call it a Roth segregation conversion strategy, where you could cherry pick the best IRA. You know, I I, I pick three different asset classes and I undo two of them that didn't do as well. Uh, well, they, they put the kibosh on that. Uh, you can't do that, so you gotta be much more clear and sure about how much you wanna convert, because there's not the undo button like we used to have on Roth, you know, the, what we used to call the Roth segregation conversion strategy. Um, the conversions can make sense for deathbed planning if you ever have a taxable estate, because the beneficiaries are probably not gonna benefit from an IRD deduction. Uh, so if you have that particular situation come up, you know, have them talk to the financial planner and accountant, run the numbers, and you'll probably find out that, hmm, you know, maybe good if uh, grandma does a Roth conversion of some of this money, particularly for uh, taxable estates. Uh, or if somebody's in a low tax bracket and the kids are in a higher tax bracket, that could work out very well if done right before death. Um, if somebody's charitable, though, don't convert that money. You use that to make uh, QCDs. Even if somebody's under 70 and a half, you know, that they, they may get there eventually, hopefully, and uh, or they may want to leave that to charity at death. If they want to fund a bequest, an IRA or 401k is just ideal for that, right? Um, ideally, not through a, a trust mixing in IRAs and, you know, individuals and charities together. Um, and of course, as financial planners, we, we try to factor in state as well as federal tax bracket differences. Is somebody going to move to, to Florida in a few years? Well, maybe you should hold off on that conversion when you don't pay any state income tax. Um, or, you know, is somebody really planning for their heirs? Uh, you know, do, the, do they live, uh, do the heirs live in a high tax state, New York City, California, Hawaii? Um, you know, that might be a factor in evaluating that too. So uh, going on to the next slide. Uh, you know, you've got people with with a lot of volatility in the market. Some people are just buy and hold. They're just sailing through, not doing very much with their portfolio, uh, keeping cool with things. Some people are going to be doing a lot of buying and selling. Uh, keep aware of the wash sale rule. Let your clients know about this. The, that's when you basically, it's going to deny a deduction when you sell securities um, and you acquire substantially identical securities, either 30 days before or after uh, the sale. You got to watch out for the IRAs because they're going to count purchases in an IRA as well, even though that's a tax exempt entity, et cetera. They uh, watch out. They kind of consider that. You can buy and sell uh, companies that are kind of close in, in you know, the same kind of market, uh, Coke, Pepsi, PG, Unilever, et cetera, but like, that's, that's okay. That's not substantially identical. What's really unclear and that's never really been clarified by Treasury or the IRS is what if I got, I got the BlackRock fund and the Schwab fund and the Fidelity fund, they may have the exact same stocks, right? Uh, when is it substantially identical? Can I sell that BlackRock and buy Vanguard? Um, yeah, they're two so totally separate companies. I could say, well, that's not identical. They're two completely different companies. On the other hand, the underlying funds are 99% the same. Uh, what if they're only overlap 75%, you know, like I've got the, you know, the S&P 100 versus the 50 or something like that. Um, we don't know. We don't know the answer to exactly where that line is crossed. So just don't over promise to clients about that issue. Going to the next slide and we'll wrap up in a couple of minutes here. The, um, it, it, this is kind of well known among anybody on this clock called don't give loss assets to charity. You give you know, uh, appreciated assets often work out much better. If you have a loss assets, tell them to sell it, take the capital loss and give cash. Um, you know, gifting to appreciated securities. Remember that's long-term holdings. So if you've got some people that have been doing some day trading, maybe they've got short-term gains, that rule doesn't necessarily apply, right? You know, this has to be long-term held one more than, more than one year, uh, appreciated securities to get that ability to 
uh, donate and get a deduction for the fair market value, not the basis. Um, if you are using donor advised funds, uh, there's a recent case out in uh, California, Fairborn v. Fidelity, and you know, to Jeff's point about bad press, and you know, uh, this is maybe one of the reasons why some people, you know, you know donor advised funds might have had a little bit of a bad name, uh, it, unfairly so, because of, there's so much useful and not abused at all by community foundations. Um, but keep in mind, don't don't put lots of restrictions on the donor advice funds ability to sell contributed assets. It's it's just asking for problems to put any kind of restrictions on the sale of stock because it might be treated as restricted stock for you know valuation purposes and compliance purposes. Um, a couple of things to keep in mind: there's this that have changed regarding the QCD, um, the qualified charitable distribution, or some people call it a charitable IRA rollover. There's now a clawback of this benefit. If somebody's working past 72, uh, the Secure and Cares Act says now, well, wait a minute, the Secure Act says I can now can uh, permitted, even at age 73, uh, I'm now permitted to put money into an IRA. Okay, it used to be you couldn't do that uh, at that age. But so in my example here, John, he's 74, he works, contributes to $60,000 $6, to an IRA, then he sends some money from a different IRA, it could be the same IRA or a different one, doesn't matter. He sends $8,000 qualified charitable distribution to a charity, even if it's in a future year, there's a clawback. Only 2,000 of that is excluded from his income. Uh, so kind of keep that in mind. If you've got clients that are still working and they're, you know, they're over 72 um, and they're, you know, and they're charitably inclined, keep this in mind. What, what are some solutions? Um, John, in our example here, if he had set up a solo 401k, that rule doesn't apply. I don't know why, but the IRS excluded that. Uh, or he could contribute to a Roth. That doesn't come under this rule and it has to be deducted. Or he could contribute to non-deductible. Uh, next slide. And uh, let's see if it comes up. If, you know, due to volatility, if somebody gifted property within nine months, remember you can make disclaimers from uh, gifts as well as usually people only think of disclaimers in the context of, you know, disclaiming an inheritance at death, but that same rule applies for gifts. And so I've got an example there. If the value goes down, the donees are agreeable, they can give it back and you know, you know, the donors use the less gift to exclusion amount. Um, so let's see, and, and I, I will have an article on this topic if somebody's kind of curious about uh, different planning ideas with disclaimers. I've got a couple of articles I can share with you. Um, but let's finish up and go to the last slide or two. Um, you know, take a look at old grats, uh, you know, because you may set up a grad with 3% rule and maybe the assets have gone down. You can, you know, freeze the estate and freeze the grad by swapping assets. Um, remember, even though a chari charitable lead annuity trust might be a grantor class, uh, don't try that <laughs> with, with just, you know, that rule about being able to swap and do installment sales and things with grantor trust that rule applies for every grantor trust, but not a grantor clat because you've got self-dealing rules and problems there if you do that. Um, but otherwise, you can do a lot of swaps back and forth. Um, and you can undo old installment sales and do a new installment sale at a 0.43% midterm rate, 1.01% this month for long term. You know, you can do a 20-year note for 1%. Um, hopefully, over time, the market's going to do better than 1%, uh, I would hope. And so that could be a winning play by basically un undoing that old transaction and redoing another one. Um, and I think that's about the last slide. I think we maybe have one more, um, a couple of uh, deathbed planning. We can, you can really add a lot of value into paying attention to basis. Uh, if you do have somebody that, uh, you know, destined for the uh, world here, you know, you, you've got somebody that you're doing some deathbed planning for, keep pay attention to the, tax basis planning as well. And particularly when somebody's gifting different charitable assets, you know, pay attention if they've got a 
maybe they don't have a big qualified plan. Maybe they've got a variable annuity instead or something like that. That's ideal. Uh, you know, annuities, you know, are going to be our income and respective of the seed and just like an IRA or 401k. Those are ideal to fund charitable bequests with. If you have loss assets, you probably want to sell those to take the loss in the decedent's final year estate. Or if not, maybe gifting them if you don't have enough gains to soak that up. At least when you gift assets, you, you know, you can at least, uh, the donees can use the carryover basis uh, for future gains to offset. And so, uh, so that gives you just a few different things that we're looking at in, in that type of planning. But I think that's about the, up on time, Lisa. I just want to point out, uh, I do have a, a couple of additional um, uh, on the, that slide with prior uh, thoughts on a couple of uh, white papers that I've updated uh, just last week, uh, if you go to the SSRN website uh, for a little bit more material. Uh, so that we can open up for questions. Thank you so much. Uh both Ed and Jeff for all of your um, great knowledge and sharing that information with us. Um, I don't have any questions yet. If somebody has any questions, please go down and uh, click on the questions and answers and happy to answer anything for you. I was just going to mention quickly, Jeff, you mentioned about uh, community foundations and the charitable gift funds, mainly Fidelity. Um, I wanted to add a few other distinctions between community foundations to make sure everybody's aware of that, and that is that community foundations can offer more than donor advised funds. Uh, we have scholarship opportunities. Uh, we have designated funds where they can designate the charities they want to support, uh, often used with their um, IRA rollovers or at planning at death, as well as uh, field of interest. So if they have a particular area that they're interested in supporting, um, whether it be education, homeless, children, uh, you name it, we can create it um, for our donors who have an interest and we have a lot of uh, backing and research on those areas of interest, as well as organization endowment funds. So these are some other opportunities outside of donor advised funds that community foundations are unique in being able to offer. And then also finally, I was gonna mention, you know, um, Dan uh, leads up our team of community research and grants management, and uh, they have great expertise on the needs of the community and the nonprofits. Um, so another opportunity that uh, will differentiate what community foundations might be able to offer uh, to you and your clients. Um, okay, we have a question. Put the email for the slides. Uh, we will go ahead and share the uh, slides uh, with everybody. I think um, Ed has a updated, email, uh, updated slides, and once I get those, I will uh, post them and share them with everybody um, after this. So this is to both our presenters. And it is, what are your expectations for personal tax rates over the next three to five years? And how might that affect your thoughts? Uh, Jeff, you're muted, I think. Yeah, there we go. So I, I guess I, so I, it's hard to say about high, the, the top tax rate, uh, because I think the, there'll be an effort to raise corporate rates and probably an effort to raise taxes on wealthy people, but that could be done by narrowing the spread between investment and ordinary income. It could be done by looking at things like carried interest. When I'm asked about this, the thing that I often try to point out, which I'm sure most folks on this call know, but you'd be surprised how many people uh, in the general public don't know, is that it's amazing given the income disparities in our country that the top tax rate kicks in at an income, like before deductions and stuff, just rounding of like roughly $700,000. Like the, the fact that there isn't a bracket at a million or two or five or 10, like it's not saying that the top bracket has to be 50 or 60 or seven, I'm not saying what the number should be, but the fact that the top tax bracket kicks in at such a modest income amount, given income disparities in the country, I think that's something that's gonna have to change. Um, and, uh, you know, so we'll see how that evolves. So I, I definitely think uh, that there'll be higher taxes on wealthy people, and I think that'll be true no matter who wins. Uh, very possible because we just have three trillion dollars of national debt uh, increase. Uh, one thing I'd point out is uh, even before um, you know COVID and in the, in the, in the huge economic crisis there. Uh, last year, uh, Mitt Romney and, and another Democrat had presented a proposal to uh, uh, end the free step up and basis of death, by the way. 
Um, and it was something similar to a carryover basis. You'd get a step up for $3 million or something along those lines and um, um, assets above that wouldn't change. So, you know, we, we probably see that hit on all fronts, you know, maybe the capital gains rate going back up to 28% where it wasn't that long before, uh, maybe the top, you know, some of the tax rates and then other things like uh, free step up and basis uh, at death and, and, and other items and maybe even freezing that uh, exclusion uh, back down to the 5 million where it was supposed to go in 2026 on the estate tax side. I wouldn't surprise me at all. And I think it's even possible, even if Trump were reelected uh, for some of this, you know, because the, they've got to start curbing the deficit somehow, eventually. Maybe not in the first year, but I would think that's a trend. Thank you both. Um, I really appreciate you both taking the time and the energy to put together the slides and the presentation for us today. This is a, a first for us, for our professional council. Uh, it may be first of many. We'll see what the uh, world holds for us, but really appreciate all of your knowledge. And, and if you'll both share with me your most updated slides, and if you're okay with it, I'll share it with everybody who attended today. Sure. Um, and if anybody has any further questions, please don't hesitate to contact either Angela or myself, and we're happy to get back to you. Um, but meanwhile, I just want to remind you, Bid Give starts June 10th, and we hope that you all participate. Um, and we really appreciate all the hard work you're doing with your clients and our uh, charitable donors. So thank you, everybody, and have a great